As I'm working on Genesis and, and in fact, all of the Old Testament Jewish material, starting with Genesis, though, we're running into these numbers that they're using as analogs. And I want to talk about that a little bit because I recently posted a video where I showed a, an, an example of a site. Let me pop it right back up here real quick. This where I was looking at meaning of numbers in the Bible. And uh, we were using the number 40 as that example, and I talked about that. What I want to say here, though, is that this actually is I, – I didn't talk about this very well. I need to talk about these numbers. I don't trust these numbers. I use them. And I use this site. We can look right here. I'm looking at number seven right now. It's used 735 times. 735 times. Don't you think that's a little bit strange? That's a lot of numbers. How about number 12? 187 times in the Bible. Um, 40. 146 times. These numbers appear so often while there is a conspicuous absence of other numbers that at some point you begin to realize they're doing something a little bit different. All right, so I want to talk about that a little bit. Um, this is Bible study stuff, and they're, they're going through and they're analyzing, they're coming up with things. I don't know where they're coming up with it. I don't trust any Christian interpretation of anything Jewish. Nothing. Nothing. It's Jewish material. They built something in. In fact, whoever, whoever, um, whoever created Judaism created it on that template. The numbers mean something in their culture that don't. That I mean, they mean something on that template. They're not real in real life. Christians are doing what? They're looking at that as literal and trying to figure out what it means. They are not interpreting it based on the inner pathway. They're interpreting it based on an outward super, uh, supernatural look at things. Their interpretations might be right or there might be some things to them that you would want to use. But what I want to do is take a look at one of these. Okay, and if I go back, uh, number 40 was the one I was talking about, but I want to use a different one that I think is easier to nail down because we're working on it with Genesis right now, and that is the number 7. Let's take a look at what our Bible study friends tell us the meaning of number 7 is. It says, The number 7 is the foundation of God's Word. It derives much of its meaning from being tied directly to creation. Used 735 times, 54 times in Revelation alone, it symbolizes completeness and perfection, both physical and spiritual. If we include with this count how many times sevenfold and seventh, one, uh, 19, 119 are used, our total jumps to 860 references. According to some Jewish traditions, the creation of Adam occurred on September 20. Yeah, according to some, you see they're just wandering off all over the place here. The Bible as a whole was originally divided into seven major divisions. They are the law, the prophets, the writings, the Psalms. The, there's a lot of symbolism in here that there, there is, but there's something very specific in Genesis at the end of seven-day creation that we know we can pin our own personal life to that very specifically tells us what seven means. And what seven means is that time in our life when we were young or at any age before we were hurt, when we were conscious, we were self-aware, we're happy, and we're not judging. We're okay with planet Earth in every way. We're okay with life. That right there is seven. Seven is a number that is analogous to the idea that this is a place where we would like to be. And this is a spiritual teaching, so these numbers are going to represent something along on that spiritual path. And at the point in creation where we are seven days old, Adam and Eve, conscious and subconscious, naked and in the garden, is the time where we are children that are in a happy, blissful state and don't have anything covering our souls. We're happy. First sin hasn't happened. That hasn't transpired yet. So this is very specifically giving us a mentally interactive point to go to that says, before you started judging life, that's what seven means right there. All this other stuff is, yeah, oh my, how wonderful. A religious definition, you can worship. A spiritual definition, you can interact with. Seven is, is very specific. Jesus is going to reference that later to, you know, get back to the kingdom of heaven within as a child. Um, 
as we go through Genesis, we're going to see sevens used as a tie point to begin other monomyth journeys. That means, so seven means creation has happened. Now the monomyth begins. In fact, let me give a quick example of that. Um, and this is, you know, there's a lot more to it than this. It's not completely consistent. There's still something else going on that I'm not sure of. Just take a look at Jude one fourteen from the Bible. Enoch, the seventh from Adam. Now that's kind of strange because he's different off, uh, different at different times in the lineage. But right here we see the seventh in Adam or seventh from Adam. And then if we go into the book of Enoch itself, right where it picks up the words of the blessing of Enoch with which he blessed the elect and the righteous who will be living in the day of tribulation when all the wicked and the godless people are to re be removed from the earth. That is the time of reckoning when we're going to go inward and start our own flood, but put in different verbiage. So you can see there's a seven link there that sounds like creation, and now we're getting ready to go do it. You see those kind of link-ups happening like that that are kind of, they're not a, they're not all the time. They're not. All right, I was editing this in the end, and I think I was kind of vague about something right here. At the end of creation, actually, there's a, there's a short myth called a creation myth that exists in front of a monomyth, a, um, a Joseph Campbell found hero of a thousand faces myth. The first myth, the monomyth that starts in Genesis is when Noah builds the ark. He's the first person chosen to go back and, and be the, the start over again. This is us wanting to start over again in life. So everything from the beginning of Genesis up to that point, which includes first sin and also the, uh, the Cain and Abel mishap, the splitting up of, you know, the one brother killing the other brother. These are common themes where one person is going to take over somebody else, you know, the, the bad wins out over the good or something. There's kind of a branching that takes out. And people are later on that are appearing in the story are actually offspring of your later self. And this whole going out and, and, um, having procreating throughout the land is indicative of the idea that we are living life and one thing leads to another, leads to another, leads to another. And that eventually leads to the story about the world being so raucous and so out of control and nobody is obeying. You know, that reflects the idea that we're doing things that you go, oh my God, what, how do I quit? <laughs> you know, we're looking to make a change. If you get to this point, you're looking to make a serious change. So... Uh, you're looking for something a little bit deeper and a little bit more solid. At any rate, the pattern then is this. Those monomyths exist all over. And if you go to Enoch, that's the beginning of a monomyth. And Noah is the beginning of a monomyth. And Enoch is seventh generation from Moses. Uh, was that right? Adam. I'm sorry. Adam. And, uh, you know, those little blended pieces in there, you look at them and just, I mean... Keep looking for patterns. I'm just looking for patterns and pieces like that. And when it reflects back to, yeah, sevens, um, we can see something here from Jesus in the, this is the Gospel of Thomas uh, out of the Nag Hammadi. Jesus said the old man, or the man old in days, will not hesitate to ask a small child seven days old about the place of life and he will live. For many who are first will become last and they will become one in the same. We want to return to our childhood mentality before we were attached to the world that we have become so attached to, which is just the world that we need to let go of to get back to what our origins were. And as much as uh, we're talking about this right here, there's actually precedence in other material that's doing the same thing. I can go to Buddhism or Taoism and find the same thing, but they're not using sevens. They're still teaching similar concepts. Um, we'll go back to uh, the Enuma Elish. They're teaching this as well, but they're not using seven as a as a point where that is. That's that's unique to the to the way that the template is being carried in Judaism that makes it sound different than other templates, despite the fact that they still shared the flood story. The author of that story had something very specific in, in, in mind, and they nested that in there. And they nested it in verbiage in a way that it's going to carry and get distributed, and it continues to morph and evolve and get taken apart and changed along the way. 
the the farther any teaching goes downhill and, and morphs, the more it has an opportunity to lose its source. The template fortunately has remained there. There's something magical about that template being in there despite other changes taking place. But when you get far enough downstream with people who are not seeing the template and they're carrying it, they're telling you um, they're telling you about the carrying case, not about what's inside, and only their version of it. However, I still like using uh, sites and resources like this because they've already they've counted up how many times it's already in there. I trust them to do that. Um, I I don't have time to, but that's nice to know. And then they reference a lot of other places where it is, so you can quickly go to it. So all of that is there. It's just when you see the definition is like all over the place and could be this and could be that and used to be here and some people think this and some that. That's not a definition. That's um, that's a religion. A definition to me in this case is, is understanding that there's a very specific place in that template. The human life, the way it experience, uh, the way we experience life and how we come about and how we can go back and resolve it, all that. And wh where the human life is and where that template is, where we can align ourselves right on it. And seven is exactly that point in time where we're that, uh, that little child that has not yet begun to judge life experiences and hold things away and become fixed and become, you know, less than that free, yay, free spirit little kid. That's that point right there. You look at it and say, no, there's more to it than that. That number 40 right there, what does that happen? That happens before... When we start out, we're in that happy place in the Garden of Eden at seven marks that point in time. Happy, naked, spiritually naked, not not hiding anything. We're, we're just happy kids. Seven denotes that point. Later, we lose that. When we go to get it back, 40 is what it requires to get that back. 40 is a step to go through to enlightenment now. Those numbers begin to emerge, and everything that they've got here are just things that they're coming up with based on how they interpret the outer shell of the religion, the carrying case. There's something inside of it that we have to find, so why we got to watch these numbers. So <laughs> I don't know how mechanical does this sound. I'm talking about the Bible. What does this sound like? So then, seven is where you want to be, but after first sin, you lose your happiness, you procreate, you begin to cover yourself until your world is raucous, and then it takes 40 to get back to seven again. <laughs> We're going back on the trip. That's what it looks like to me. I, I mean, um, I'm not positive, but it, that seems to be what is there. And the numbers are are not vague. They're very. They mean something very specific on this pattern. They're not all over the place, like like uh, like theism is going to bring you. It's an outward looking gate. One of the many looking outward. Okay. What I want to do is talk a little bit. I guess just to. Just to have fun with it. I want to talk about what I'm doing with Genesis a little bit. I'm not prepared to anything <laughs> with the video on that one. But uh, uh, let me just show you what I'm looking at here. All right. And I think I'm going to just talk about this because it helps me get ideas. But uh, if I pull it up here. I start right off with the Genesis creation story. As I interpret and compare, this is what I'm kind of doing. First of all, I've got it broken down into kind of story blocks. I, I don't like the format that the Bible is written. That was something that was not original. The chapters and verses were added in later to um, help probably for study or reference or something like that. It would make a lot of sense if you're trying to reference something to somebody. But um, as I'm trying to read it and understand it, I don't like it like that. What I've, I like it in these blocks like this. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void and darkness covered the face of the deep and God swept over the face of the waters. Right there, there's a break. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and morning the first day. So I like to break them down like this. If we go into day two, that one's pretty short. Day three, same. Okay, we get a little bit more here. We see where it says... And God said, let the waters under the sky be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth and the waters that were gathered together. He called seas and God saw that it was good. So there's one event happening right there. 
The next one, then God said, let the earth put forth vegetation plants. So see how I, I'm, I'm trying to break them down into like events. They're easier for me to maybe mentally read. I've also started doing things. You see where I put here this empty monotheism. I'm going to just, everywhere I go through a verse, I'm referencing what's there. This is monotheism. This, this whole third day is monotheism. Monotheism there, monotheism on day five. It's day six right here. Um, here we go. Then God said, let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness and let them have dominion over... Well, that was it right there. Let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness. Right there, that's it. There is no more reference to a plural God. But right there, there was a, a shift from polytheism to monotheism that happened right there. And it doesn't happen anywhere else. So I'm just kind of, I'm noting that. <laughs> That's all I'm doing at this point, making notes. Also, as I go through here, I do try to identify what things are in here. And this is difficult as you go back. I think there might be superfluous details. I think there's a point where you go back far enough. I'm not certain if they have something there that I can't understand and I might, or I might be trying to put something in it that they would smile and say, okay, if you say so. <laughs> you know? The point where we are is actually where there is creation. At any rate, okay, here's what I've, let me, let me go to the end of this. I'm sorry, I got bouncing this all over the place. If you're trying to follow, I know this is horrific. The video won't be like this. Here's what I get out of here. We emerge from the all, we can become anything. We become what we experience and classify everything cycles, we will experience manifestations or fruits from our emotionally stored experiences called seeds. Those seeds continue to produce fruit in kind. We'll trigger with our hurt. We are aware, however, happy and unashamed. Let me back up that five right there. We will experience at this point anything. We, number two, we can become anything at this point. There is no, first sin has not happened at this point yet. Everything is on the good side of childhood prior to life turning sour. This is all happening mentally in that, uh, that time frame. Um, or mental space frame, rather. Number six, we are aware, happy, and unashamed of anything in life. This is this, our spiritual nakedness. We have, we're uh, in the garden, naked, no fears and nothing to hide. We have been given creative power over our life, but we don't know how to use it. The, the, let's go back and look at that. We've been given creative power. Um, then God said, let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness. Okay, so there's something bigger going on out there that is beyond us. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea. They're talking about us and over the birds of the air and over the cattle and all the wild animals of the earth. The earth is of us and it's our life. The wild animals, cattle, birds of the air, fish of the sea, those are all referencing something. The, um, the sea, the air, and the earth are three things there that I believe are going to equate later to the same thing as Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, that that is a trilogy right there going on. But the, the air is the upper, the earth is the physical, and the sea is where everything emerges from the spiritual, the air, thoughts, things like that. We are old enough where we are being given dominion over our life experiences right here. No matter what it is, wild animals, every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created mind in his image and in the image of God, he created them male and female, he created them. So in the cosmos, anything that is humanly possible is there. We're given that at birth. And then as we're having life experiences, we get dominion over what those experiences are. Now that we don't like them or are ashamed of them and we store them away, this is us having dominion and we're actually creating our own life. I still don't know where they're pulling the polytheism from. Anyway, yeah, I'm looking at this. Um, I, I'm very comfortable that this... Uh, what, oh, what else did I see here? No, number seven, rest, allow time for changes to unfold, brain wires. I'm not certain. You know, one thing that I do know is that if we're trying to learn something or undo something, the brain is a electrochemical network of 
synapses all grown together, that change can take a little while to take place, that we have to stick with it to change habits or to create new habits or to get rid of things to unwind from situations. Anyway, I'm, I'm not sure if that, certain if that's it. Rest, uh, discovery, take time, I'm not sure. But it does appear, though, seven, since it appears elsewhere, as we discussed earlier, that uh, it looks like seven is creating an analog for a mental state of being and our personal awareness. We are not yet divided against ourselves. We will fit with future stories on the Jewish religion monomyth, or it will fit with future stories uh, on the Jewish religion monomyth network. It also fits into Jesus' teachings as far as you know, the child seven days old. It all harkens back to this. This is the origins. It also aligns with Taoist and Buddhist teachings in the beginning, though this one is much bigger with more parts. And I don't, I'm not going to take time in this video to go ahead and do that uh, um, to, to show that. Um, what I will say that in Taoism and, and Buddhism, they're very short. Um, it, it doesn't have this whole creation from nothing. Taoism does. Taoism says the, the way, the life experience that can be told is not the real one. The potential for everything is there. Very quickly, we name things. Naming things means that we are deciding what they are and putting them away. We are becoming that person right away. In Genesis, that doesn't happen until first sin. So there's a lot being stacked in Genesis in the beginning where there's like a couple of lines in Taoism. Buddhism doesn't have creation at all. Buddhism goes right, the first verse in the, in the Dhammapada tells you that uh, anyone who has had an evil thought that Pain follows you like the the wheel follows the ox that draws the the cart or something like that. This we, we're getting this idea right off the bat. Cycles are happening though; that they're bad cycles. That's the seeds and the plants in the in the Genesis work. Something is coming around. It is bad. It's based on something that you have named. It's been a thought. It's the words are all the terms are all meant for you to seek what's there. It's at a very deep level. I had thought one time, I hate you, and I never fixed that. So somewhere up here in the background, I still hate you. That is what is acting out. In all cases, or what we're naming, or when we're given dominion, that is what we are starting to do. Um, it sounds like you're given control of the world. That works in a population in, in a way that's a lot different than in Taoism and Buddhism, it is known to be a, a guru's path. Here is for you. Come and find this. People who are interested go and find the old man on the mountain and ask him, what's life about? And they get these verses and they have to go figure them out. And in figuring them out, it wires their brain. Maybe that's what the rest day is, day seven. Then you don't just know it um, academically. You know it's experientially. You live it. It becomes a part of your life. It would make sense. It's a storytelling culture. Back, yeah, our our life is so radically different. We can't and we can't envision it. Kids are not going to school. They, they're they're helping out. They're doing errands. Um, there's no media. Yeah, life is a lot different. Anyway, okay, where was I? You know what? Let me get back onto what I was doing over here. I, as I get back down into. Oops, I got to go actually to the page itself. Uh, there was that one transition from polytheism to monotheism. In the same verse, we were given dominion over our world. Day six, elaborate. As our own God, we now have creative power. This means we are mentally developed enough to decide what goes into our memories. We now create our own world. Life by the accumulation of life's experienced experiences, unchecked or unresolved. But what was the we? Yeah, I still don't know what that is. Where did that, what was that, what was that shift from? <laughs> we will. Okay, get into the second one. I haven't put as much into it, but I can see different things right here. This is, it's a monotheism. The, all of them are. This one kind of sounds like we just come into existence. We are born of stardust. Uh, yeah, it's kind of strange. No, I'm, I, I'm just putting those notes in there. I don't, I'm not, I don't have that nailed down. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed out of the 
ground the Lord God made to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, and the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So uh, let's let's look at some analogs. Eden, um, in the, if we're going to play it out in the psyche, they're going to have to be some hierarchical parts inside of our mind. Eden then is looks to be representing a happy or a pure state of, of being. The tree is going to be a framework of future experience. Life can go any way from, from here. Whatever the, the main qualities of whatever we are becomes is all based on this structure, this tree. Food is what we consume, learn, believe, remain attached to. We begin there and the potential for good life or bad life is ready to go. This one's a little more nebulous, but I, I, and I haven't spent as much time with it. But uh, out of the ground, the Lord God made to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, and also the tree of life, also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So what we're establishing right here is the potential for anything. Right here, you can have a good life, you can have a bad life. What is going to happen, we know what's going to eventually happen. The river flows out of Eden to water the garden, and from there it divides and becomes four branches. And then it goes off into here. Let me, let me just jump down a little bit. I'm not going to put too much more into this. Eden, mental state of being, this peer, childhood bliss. River denotes a process. It's a placeholder and analog for mental states of being. We flow in life along the river from Eden. I'm going to suggest this mental states because as we go through the material, we're going to find that all of this stuff works out that way. That there is, as in Taoism, a way, a flow, a life experience that you have based on the quality of your life experiences, what we're holding up here what we've let go of, what we're clinging to, that that is a way of life. And that the same thing is happening here, except that it's going to be how God is gracing you, how God is helping your life, what kind of life you are living in accordance with God is how is how it is put across here. A person can look inward and do that. If a person looks outward still with conviction, it'll still work. The problem is when you're looking outward, most people don't have the conviction. What are we doing though? If you are forgiving somebody for a better life, you are, you have a, you have a something in your mind that is hurt, that is up there, that is creating issues that needs to be resolved. There are mental states that appear in the material and that come through here and that in changing those mental states, it changes our flow. It changes our way. This river right here, I'm going to suggest is that right here from the way, from Eden, from the way we experience life, from how good we feel to wherever the four rivers, the, the higher being, the consciousness, the subconscious, and all of the characteristics that we have stored away, all of the little things that we have in a wall that we have put away. Not everything we have put away is bad stuff. Some stuff is. There's a difference in it. At any rate, those four rivers are being established here because the material works that way. That was not in the first creation story. When we go through God helping whoever it is on the hero's journey to go back and feed the, to defeat the demons and to wipe out the female in some cases because that's representing the subconscious that got um, made astray by early life. It's not the female. Or... Uh, having new offspring that uh, floods, wiping things out, all of that are parts of the mental process that the stories talk about. So these five rivers, I'm convinced that that's what they are, even though I can't look at them and go, wow, it's so simple to see. It's not. It's not simple to see, and I can tell it's not simple to see. The five beams in the head of Marduk, appears very early on in the Babylonian creation myth, the Enuma Elish. And Marduk is going to be the one that is going to, that, that's the hero in Marduk that's going to go back and um, use those five qualities to defeat our previous self. At any rate, okay, that's what I see there. Let me um, go look at it again. Yeah, I was looking at things here, just what they are. Perfumery, incense as traditional medicine. Onyx primarily refers to parallel, parallel banded variety of chalcedony, a silico mineral. You know, that almost sounds like India's lingas. 
has a long history of use for hard stone carving and jewelry. Da, da, da. Anyway, they're using, okay, so they're using the terms, but they're meaning something to them. As in, if I was saying, uh, we went to Los Angeles, but the story, we didn't really go to Los Angeles. I went to um, someplace angelic because it's known as the city of angels. So I'm using it as an analog for something different. Or I went to Las Vegas, Sin City, or whatever. There's a, every, every city has its own name, right? That's what I'm going to suggest they've got going on here. Is that these places exist in their culture, so the story's going to work. It really is. But that the, the, but that the, the component parts, the names, the, the, the nouns and the verbs are analogous to something different. They're, they're on that template. The Lord God took the man, put him in the Garden of Eden to till it and keep it. You may free to. So we've been given permission to go ahead and make our choices. Uh, monotheism. The primary instruction here is to tell us that we will die if we begin to judge life. Spiritual death, no longer feeling inner peace, now accumulating life experiences. Remember it said you may freely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil... You shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it, you shall die. Okay, we're alive when we're little children. Once we start experiencing life and we go off course, that is when we have our spiritual death. We have consumed of that tree. Um, it's not good that the Lord should be alone. That didn't happen up here, actually. We're just being admonished ahead of time not to do that. Then the Lord God said, it's not good that man should be alone. I'll make him a helper. So all the animals come out. Animal of the field, physical experience, manifest actions, birds of the air, mental or thinking experience, thoughts. We just, we're given charge of our own self. We're getting old enough to say, yeah, up yours. No, I'm not doing it anymore. I hate you. Um, we, we are now taking over mentally. Um, so the, the, yeah, the, this is just a long story, all analogous stuff. This is the emergence of our subconscious woman, soul, or for spiritual interaction, mind, subconscious portion. We are the young children at this stage, but developmentally complete. We have not judged our life experiences a manner as to rid us from even Eden. And then therefore a man leaves his father and his mother, clings to his wife. Okay, we, this is, looks like we're leaving our past behind and shifting in, internally. This is almost an outward to inward looking uh, teaching which appears elsewhere, you see that the father and the mother, you leave them. That is your physical mother and father and cling to your wife. That would be analogously marriage, but this shifts into cling to your subconscious. We're not going to cling to our wives or our husbands in real life. This is what is said right here, but what if you find you're within, you know, what if it doesn't work? We need to cling to our soul, our spirit, our subconscious. When we become separated, that's what the issue is. So we've just transitioned from leaving the physical world, turning inward and clinging to your inner being. If you're living life and you sit there at some point going, why am I doing this? Uh, you're, leave, you're, you're dual. You're not married. Uh, that's it. That's all, I wanted, uh, that's all I wanted to say on that. I was looking at some other things with the Hermetic Principle 7 and things like that. But yeah, you can see where I am with this. It's kind of, uh, uh, hang on, let me get this shot back off. I get lost navigating this. I'm not used to it yet. Anyway, that's where I am with it. But you can see it's just kind of fun stuff, poking around with things and trying to figure it out. And eventually, I know what it goes to and where it fits. I, I, I'm not worried that I'm going to be straying off someplace. I'm more worried that I look at it and go, I don't know what they mean by that. And you and you think, okay, I can put a lot into it that they probably didn't know. You know, that whole stardust thing. I'm pretty sure they didn't know, you know, what the periodic tables were, or that we were made of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and a handful of salts, things like that that are very cosmic things. But it seems that they knew that we emerge somehow. They're watching and looking and go, where do people come from? Where does the I know the mother gets pregnant, but how does it what the Yeah, we're emerging from that. And when you look at the unfolding of the universe, starting from gases and exploding stars and harder elements that coalesce and become planets in the time that we're somewhere in that process, not even in the beginning. We are, we're in that process. We're not separated from it. We can't be. There's no possible way to be outside of the process of the universe. 
we don't think of it in those terms, so it sounds really like, what are you talking about? That's kind of airy-fairy. But if you think about it, we just don't think that far out there, that we are, that everything is moving in cycles like that, and the material is showing us that, but also experientially we see it. The big thing for seeing cycles is for us to recognize what we have going on if we're at a point where we want to grow and we begin to recognize, okay, this is what I'm doing. This is what triggers it. This is the reason it's happening, and that must be something then that is that ties to something in my past that is of that same kind of a nature. And and then we use our high, higher being to interact with our consciousness to tell our to, to go explore those stories. I got hurt. I don't want to look at it ever. It's too hurtful. Okay, we're going to go look at it because you're not going to heal if you don't. The higher being helps the conscious and so tells the conscious, it's okay. Meanwhile, the conscious is broke up while the offspring are coming out. All of this, all of the things that we deny that they're always trying to come out. Now we're going, all right, yeah, come out. Let me look at you. As we do that, we start becoming familiar with them. We see the energy of them. They dissipate because we realize we're the ones that are giving them their power. Once we stop, the harder we don't look at them, the stronger they are. The more we look at them, the more they weaken, the more they come into the light. Before I end the video, let's just quickly recap. I don't want to go into tons of detail here. Um, that uh, That's still ahead and I'm still working on it, but there's some fun things to look at right now. Um, and I know that if I, if I go through this and fumble through it to the best I can, that uh, it, something else will come to me. So it'll help me to, to, uh, to fumble through it. Okay, creation one, we have the emerge from the all. We can become anything. We become what we experience. Everything cycles. We experience manifestations or the fruits of our life from our emotionally stored experiences, which they called seeds, which continue to pr produce more of whatever it is made of. You know, whatever the, uh, you know, what, whatever, if it's shame, if it's anger, the emotional quality of it is going to continue to emerge in the same emotional state. Uh, but at this point in time, we're not there yet. We are, at this point in time, we're young. We are happy. We are aware, unashamed of everything in life. We're spiritually naked. No fears, nothing to hide. We've been given creative power over our life, but we don't yet know how to use it. We haven't yet. Day seven, time for... Changes brain. Yeah, that appears. Seven days is being created as an analog, as a mental state. We went through all this, didn't we? But I'm just going to quickly refresh it here. Transitions from the polytheism to monotheism. Let's go to creation two and see what it does. This says we emerge. Full life potential is in place at birth. There's one river of life experience exists for each of us. We're told that there is a choice that will become our life. Choosing at first is unconscious mental activity based in physical physical experience and we're storing emotion emotional hurt with the memory choosing is what happens at in every moment this is how we're choosing to experience life how we manage it and how it goes into our mind and how it wires our experience we are given the authority to choose for ourselves we're conscious and feeling and that means from where we come from that doesn't mean we get to choose our life. What that means is whatever experience you have, you choose the nature of the experience of that life and put it away. We emerge from some place we're stuck in. We're trying to leave that behind. We're given the authority to choose the way we want to hold on to our experiences. If that hurt, I can choose whether it hurt or not. I can choose whether it continues to hurt or not. That's the choosing for ourselves that we're talking about. We take dominion that, remember, okay, this plays out in the mind. What you're choosing is your mental condition, not your physical life, your mental life, okay? We're given the authority to choose for ourselves. We're conscious and feeling. We take dominion of the creation of our earth, life, personal life experiences. Uh, after we have taken charge of our thoughts, subconscious is beginning to take shape. This is our self-awareness or soul denoting analogously as the emerging woman. So this is now we are becoming man and woman, uh, conscious, self-aware. We leave our physical mother and father and are instructed to remain connected to our wife or inner self. There's no unresolved or inner conflict at this point. We are mentally self-aware and happy at this point in life. Okay, both versions share this. We emerge from the all. Our life potential is to be what we are to become. Well, what we are, whew, our life potential is to be what we are to become. <laughs> and that is wide open. I'm, I'm not done with this. 
we will choose who we become through the emotional quality of our mental perceptions of those experiences. That is something we're going to do when we choose whether we take partake of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil or the tree of life. This is us choosing our experiences, but we, you know, we, this is not physical choosing, mental choosing, mental choosing. And that, you know, that's always a tough one, the choosing one, because we say we did not choose that. This is not choosing the physical experience. It's not choosing your life. It's not choosing anything like that. It's not choosing what happens to you. It's choosing the way you store it away in your brain and that it continues to reside there. Let's go through the differences of these. What we see is version one establishes seven days as a self-aware, not yet judging place to be. So seven days is going to continue to emerge then throughout the material as this place right here. This is important uh, to establish. This is where we want to be. This is the goal of our material as our and our pathway is to get to this point. It teaches us that everything will cycle. It teaches us that what emerges is from its source, cause and effect, that what comes out of us is comes from a stored memory or something that is put away that is of that nature. It transitions that one time from the polytheism to a monotheism. And the best I can say there is that the if you if you find the template, you realize it's so prevalent and you can read it that the people who are writing these stories and passing along the template, they could all read each other's material. Whoever is writing this knows full and well that um, that Hinduism is not real, but they see the template and they see that the Hindus are using multiple gods and they know that somebody might come along later and write stories for this too. So they're making sure to say that when you do this, make sure that you make it it, that it goes from polytheism to monotheism. These stories exist on a monotheistic frame where there's one God taking care of thing, taking care of things instead of the polytheistic like Greeks use or uh, other people use. The monotheism does not mean that there was suddenly one God. That means that the material suddenly changed to one God. Outwardly, it's a different uh, story. Anyway, okay, that's there. It looks like an instruction, perhaps, to storytellers or an error. I don't think it's an error. I think it's a precise instruction. I'm, I'm open to ideas. Version 2 establishes that there is a flow in life. It establishes four mental processes to engage with the flow in life. And that is how the material works. When we go through it, we're going to find that there are five, th those five parts, the flow in life and who and what we are up here, is where every bit of those stories play out. Every bit of it plays out here. This is like, here's your, here's your framework. Stay on this right here. There's a flow in life. There's those four parts up here. That's how the material works. We become conscious and subconscious, male and female, and we're told to remain spiritually connected, which means no inner conflict ex if conflict exists. And it also tells us in that time when we're supposed to leave our mother and father behind and cling to our wife that that is uh, the analog telling us to turn from outward looking to inward looking. And if you've gone through my material, all I can say is we see that in other places uh, throughout material. Uh, they, they seem more like kluges elsewhere, but um, in this case, you look at it and, and it, it's pretty smooth. It's an easy transition um, to miss. You know, that whole idea that you're supposed to leave your mother and father and cling to your wife sounds like an instruction for a man that that's this whole patriarchal thing that just screws everything up today. This is each and every individual. We leave our mother and father behind and we cling to our inner being, whether you're a man or a woman. That's your male part, your consciousness, and and the female part is your subconscious. That Those are analog terms. People that get hung up in those and can't get past them, yeah, you're not ready to go on the path. Analogs means that the term doesn't necessarily mean what what it sounds like. It might. Fasting in the physical world is the same as fasting in the spiritual world. Consuming in the physical world means that you're eating physically, but consuming in the spiritual world means that you're you're taking in knowledge, so you're still... Uh, somehow developing yourself. And this one goes so far as to work this well, that if you're eating good stuff in the physical world and eating properly, you're healthy. And if you're eating a bunch of crap and garbage, you're not going to be. Spiritual world, same thing. If you're eating really good stuff, manna in the desert, nothing else, you're going to find out 
that these are analogous terms for letting everything else go and only consuming what you need to to get where you need to be in order to to uh, to get to the to the place you want to get to. They're going to the Holy Land. We're going to same place. We'll call it whatever you want to. Enlightenment is what we're calling it. We want to get back to that point where we don't have all this stuff inside of our heads. However, um, being naked or stripping naked in the physical world is the same also as, as being naked in the spiritual world. In the physical world, you're covered. In the, um, in the physical or spiritual world, it represents being uh, covering yourself. However, the difference here is that in the physical world, we think, oh, that's not a good thing to do. You don't want to be naked. So we disconnect from it. And when, when actually in the spiritual world, it's desirable to be naked because everything gets taken off. we got to watch the analogs. Here's how you keep them on track. You don't use the words. It's always conceptual. How does it play out in the psyche? Don't grab the global meaning of the word and go with you. If I'm anchored to something, don't look at me as a boat and an anchor. We know that means I'm hanging on to something. Make that shift with everything. Maintain the hierarchy. Okay, that's all I have uh, right now with it. You see what I'm doing with it. You see I'm analyzing and picking it apart and making comparisons with other things and realizing that there's stuff in here that um, is it's instructions to how to use the material and how to heal. Um... And if and they sound weird if you try to read it, I mean, look at that that thing right there, the flow. There are parts that were uh, replicated in both stories that didn't have to be. You know, when we get to the flood story, there's two versions uh, going up into that. Is that going to tie in with the two versions of here, where there are multiple things going on that people tried to combine and combine it uh, in the way that looks the best for a religion? But it nests all the material that we're looking for. It tells us our seven days in one story. We didn't know if the other one wasn't in there that we would have the five components. We needed both stories. They both had different things in there that we need to go through this material. I am very convinced that it is incredibly structured in the material. Um, and that this template is yeah, very, very viewable. But there's a, boy, there's a, there's a transition that has to be made in order to see it. When you do see it, it pops open. You have to turn it inward and learn how those analogs shift. That's what I'm going to suggest. If you're carrying it, you don't see that. You're looking at the wrapping paper. Okay. Um, hope that was fun. I'm still working on it. And uh, I'm sure that this will help unwind things. But there's a point where I'm going to leave it and then move into the rest of the story. Because the first, the, the, this, this section right here from creation to the preparation, what, right where Noah is called, that right there is a piece of template that was not identified in the monomyth. And I want to really nail that down. But that piece of template exists elsewhere. But it doesn't exist hundreds of times. The monomyth exists at the beginning. I mean, the, the creation myth or creation parts exist at the beginning of every teaching, whether it's Taoism, Buddhism, whatever the case may be. They're very short, modified versions or sometimes big, long versions. They're all going to get to the same material we, um, or teach the same thing. You know, here we're being told there's cycles. In Buddhism, we're told that the wheel follows. Cycles are there. The material is there if we play it out conceptually. We continue to see what is there. And that's what I'm doing. I'm just playing it out in my mind until it makes sense without being some kind of supernatural, um, you know, I don't, I don't want to be flabbergasted by this stuff. I want to read it and go, okay. I see what those guys are doing. I see what they're doing. But we it, it takes, yeah, just a lot of analysis. You see what I'm doing. I'm analyzing it. I'm picking it apart. I'm putting it in places. There's a process that I'm using. Okay. Uh, yeah, hope this was fun. I'll keep working on it. And when I get to the actual one, I'll, it should look better. I just needed to get this out there because, yeah, like I said, it helps me to do a data dump sometimes. Love one another. I'll see you in the next video.